this is a quokka. And this is also a quokka. Damien here, hope you're all doing well. Uh, I've been given this quokka drum to review today, so I'm going to do that for you. Uh, I'm going to go through, I mean, initially it was just going to be a, you know, have a bit of a play with it, see what you think. Um, but it's actually quite an interesting drum, so I thought I'd break it down a little bit more and go through some of the shell compositions and what it's all about and, and what that means for someone wanting to buy a drum like this. Um, now, it's no surprise, you know, custom builder out of Perth, out of Western Australia, there's no shortage of those now. Um, we're very lucky in Western Australia to be given um, you know, a region of the world where we have some great wood for making drums, really, really good wood for making drums. And, you know, it's, it's made us pretty much the envy of a bunch of other countries. You know, you have performers coming from all over the world, famous artists wanting to buy drums from this region of the world because of the wood. Now I'm going to get into the wood a little bit la later on and, and, you know, what makes that so special and why people want it so badly. Um, but let's firstly get, oh, just go over what this drum's all about. So it's a 14 by 7 inch, 7 inches deep, 14 inch across. It's a 9 ply jarrah uh, with 9 ply reinforcement rings as well. Uh, now, the, uh, Tim, the, the owner of uh, Quokka Drums, has said that the drums can be made from block if you prefer, um, but this is the, the ply version. Uh, and the 9 plies comes out to about 6 mil, so they're not particularly thick plies. So an overall shell thickness of about 6 millimeter or 12 meter once you add the, the re-rings top and bottom. Uh, and what you're seeing on the front here is a single ply of black sassafras veneer. Uh, quite an interesting looking wood. And uh, all coated with a two-pack polyurethane. So that's fairly standard stuff. Uh, the bearing edge itself is a double cut offset 45 degree bearing edge. Uh, I like that personally because when you have a straight cut or a single straight cut, and I'll put a graphic up in a second, you'll see that um, the, the actual bearing edge ends up protruding quite far out, almost to the edge of the shell. And if you're using heads that have a sort of a, a curl, which is, which is most of them, although it does differ from, from head to head, what you find is when the bearing edge is too far out, you end up having that edge sitting on the curvature of the drum head. And of course, that makes them difficult to seat, uh, makes them even more difficult to tune. So the fact that this is a, has a countercut 45, that actually brings the bearing edge in away from the edge of the drum and makes sure that the contact area of that bearing edge is actually on the flat part of the drum head. So again, makes it easier to tune up and, um, and, and do whatever you need to do with it. Uh, and you know, we talk about resonance, having a drum head that's sitting flat uh, and able to, when I say able to resonate really, really well, a lot of people say, oh, but I don't like resonance in my drum. And you, you've got to remember that it's, it's, it's better to have too much resonance because you can always control that with some duct tape or some moon gel or whatever it is that you prefer. Um, but to not have enough resonance when you need it, you can't really do anything about that. So one of the things I look for in a snare drum is to make sure that there is a good deal of resonance coming from that drum, uh, more than I'll ever need, and then I just tame it back as I need to. Now, of course, not all drums can actually have a bearing edge that's, that's you know, routed or manufactured very sharp. Um, there are limitations on what you can do and a lot of that comes down to the quality of the wood uh, and the quality of the machining. We'll get into the wood a little bit later on, but again, it's, it's kind of interesting that it's a double 45 cut. Uh, of course, you've got sanded snare beds on the bottom part of the shell. Um, but other than that, apart from the fact that it is a jar ply, it's a fairly standard construction of a shell. Um, this one came fitted with the Evans HD dry top and a Remo uh, USA resonant bottom or snare side bottom. Again, nothing, nothing too unusual there. Um, I, given it was a, a display sample, I just kind of used the head that was on there. Personally, I would have liked to have tried using some, you know, some Remo Ambassadors, um, Emperor, P3, Black Dot, just a choice of heads because I think it's a really good way to tell how the drum's going to work in the real world because we do often put different heads on our drum, sometimes even show to show. So, uh, but what I think you'll find in the review is that I managed to put this in so many different circumstances that I think it would be fine changing out heads. Um, you'll find that it actually has quite a good tuning range and good response no matter what I did with it. So, uh, Now the hardware, triple flanged hoops top and bottom. These are not die cast rims. Some people like die cast rims. I do too on the right drum. Um, but the triple flanged hoops have a little bit more give to them. Um, that actually works, I think, on this particular drum. There was one or two setbacks which could be attributed to triple flanged hoops, but we'll get more into that later. The throw-off is a mighty Trick GS007. Again, in my opinion, probably one of the, if not the best uh, snare throw-offs on the market right now. Really, really smooth, um, billet aluminium, so very, very light. 
Uh, and this is a three-stage version in black, so you can actually, it's not just a case of having the snare on or off, you can actually have three little settings, which is, you know, partially off, a little bit more of the snares off, and then eventually completely off. So you can set it up to three different ways, uh, depending on your, your need. The lugs themselves are a full-length chrome brass lug, so there's 10 of these, and it's a single-length single, single length lug, um, fixed at two points, you can even see it here, you've got a top and bottom point there. This is good because you've got a full-length lug design, but we're not, we're not um, you know, cutting off the resonance or, or, or screwing with the shell in any way because we've only got it anchored at two points. Uh, now they've got nylon inserts on the back of these lugs, which means we're not going to be damaging the shell by screwing them in. Uh, and on the inside of the shell, uh, there's actually quite large steel washers uh, and I believe that the reason for doing that would be uh, when you're tensioning these lugs into the shell having a thick washer helps to disperse that force that's being put on that screw and onto that lug and that of course means that you're not going to damage the shell from the back end as well. Uh, that's actually quite important to do on some softer woods. With Jarrah it's probably overkill but it doesn't hurt to have that feature there. Now one interesting thing about the lugs is they're actually solid lugs so with a lot of lugs, you, you can actually open them up and they're hollow inside and then some of them have springs and moving parts and all that sort of stuff. Um, these are solid. Now, very cool to have solid. It does make them a little bit heavier, um, but the beauty of solid lugs, of course, is that nothing's going to rattle or move around inside uh, and structurally there's a lot more integrity there, uh, which is actually quite significant and quite useful. Uh, to give one example, when you go into a studio, because when things are rattling and rolling around and you've got microphones on every single part of your drum, sometimes it gets really frustrating trying to you know, find those sounds and uh, isolate them or change out a drum and to get rid of it. Um, so solid lugs actually do have a purpose and it's quite useful. Uh, and then of course we've got the Quokka Drums badge. Now this is also made locally um, and mounted with two little Phillips head screws either side of the badge. So again, not a lot of shell contact there. It's backed with what looks to be a a nylon gasket, so again, no metal to shell contact, which is really, really good. The combined weight of the drum is about 3.7 kilos, or 3,764 grams, uh, and about 30% of that, or 1131 grams, is the shell itself. So the shell makes up about one third of the total mass or weight of this, of this shell. Uh, that can be significant because depending on the ratio of shell weight to hardware weight, so for example, if there was a lot of weight in hardware, that can actually very much affect uh, how the shell responds uh, and how it resonates and, and all those sorts of things. Uh, but in terms of shell weight to combine weight, they're about two to one, pretty average. Uh, now, I know a lot of people ask about this, but I'm not gonna actually talk about the sound of the drum. Um, and the reason I'm not is because this is, it's an infinitely changeable thing when we talk about snare drums. I, mean, we, I just spoke earlier about being able to flip out some of the snare heads to something different, and that will significantly change the sound of the drum. Uh, and to be honest, look, anything I would have recorded, it's going to sound different to your ears when you're hearing it, you know, and that could be depending on even just the quality of your ears, let's say. But certainly um, the room that I'm recording it in, the microphone, whether I'm using just an iPhone at a gig or whether I'm using like a proper studio microphone, so the room itself is going to make a difference. The speakers you're listening to on are going to make a difference. There's so many variables there. Um, and when people say, oh, what does it sound like? I think what they're really asking is, does it feel good to play? And am I going to like the sound of it? Does it sound like a good snare drum? Um, and yeah, absolutely it does. And for the cost of a custom snare, you'd expect that it would. The thing you want to take from this, and, and the, the impressive point about it, is that it's a versatile drum. You can change the sound as many ways as you like. Uh, and, and that's a really cool thing. So the testing that I did on this particular drum, I took it to four different um, performances. The first one was an outdoor party and it was a very low volume kind of setup. We were just sort of in a backyard there. The drums were mic'd, but it was, it was pretty low volume, obviously, because you've got neighbors around. It was like a 60th birthday party or something like that. Um, so we mic'd the drums up. I took this opportunity to tune this drum particularly low. And the reason I did that is because when you tune a drum very, very low, Often to get good response and a, and a good sound out of it, you tend to have to hit a little bit harder. Um, so I, I really wanted to push the boundary of this thing and say, well, what if I tuned it as low as I think it can go, but then I play softly on it, ghost notes, playing out towards the edge, those sorts of things. And this is where a lot of drums just, they'll either sound flappy or they won't really respond properly. Now, bear in mind, I have to adjust my snare wires, the tension of the snare wires to accommodate this lower tuning. Um, but what I found was that it actually performed really well without any issues at all. So it was great. And even at a very, very low tuning, it was still very responsive um, with just a 
you know, just a quick adjustment of the snare wire tension to accommodate. So that was fine, that was all well and good. The next uh, outing that this snare got was actually a much, much larger show. It was still an outdoor show. Um, it was a Sunday afternoon, it was you know, 500 plus people, uh, a long, long way away from the stage. We were in sort of like a, like a bunker, we're actually on a veranda, but we had a lot of feedback. So from, from the perspective of the drummer, from my perspective, it was really, really loud on stage. Um, but the interesting thing about this particular show is that I tuned the drum up to like a medium tension, or what I would consider a medium tension. And I think this is where this particular drum really shines. Um, it responded really well. I could hear every, every single note. Like, as I said, it was very, very loud on stage, but even when I was playing, you know, ghost notes, when I was moving out and doing press rolls on the edge of the drum, you could still hear everything. And it's kind of like, if you know anything about uh, audio recording and they talk about compression, about being able to take those really loud notes and just squash them down and make those low notes sort of pop through the mix a little bit more, it kind of felt like it naturally did that at this tension. Uh, so, you know, I mean, yes, it was mic'd, uh, but it was very, very loud on stage. Um, and it, I could hear everything, which was really good. And I've played a lot of top end snares that, that aren't able to do that. They're all very loud snares and they all have a great sound to them, but they don't really project those ghost notes or the lower volume um, parts of your performance through. Um, and that tells me that the drum responds very, very well. And that could be partly to do with the fact that it's Jarrah. Um, but it could be manufacturing, it could be a whole bunch of things. Um, I think it also benefited from this high attention as well to help it push those notes through. Uh, one negative thing that came out of that show is that because I was playing a lot harder, uh, when I finished that gig, one of the tension bolts on the resonance side had actually worked itself loose and had fallen out. Um, happens from time to time on, on certain snares, but I've seen it before, no big deal, picked it up, screwed it back in and off we went. Test number three was an indoor show. This was a small club. Again, very loud, we were mic'd up, lots of people around, jam-packed, you know, the, the typical Saturday night in the city kind of show. Um, again, playing quite loud, left it at medium tuning, uh, worked very, very well for the medium tuning. The, the rim shot in particular is really nice. There's not a lot of horrible overtones. Um, part of that is, could be attributed to the fact that we had the HD dry skin, which of course, with that ring underneath, will actually absorb some of that anyway but it was easy to get the sound that I needed, uh, mic'd up beautifully. Uh, but once again, the louder volume um, was such that when I'd finished the show, one of the tuning bolts, in fact, I think it was the same tuning bolt, had worked itself uh, loose and was on the floor again. So at that point, I'm th sort of thinking, okay, well, maybe we're gonna need to do something about this. Uh, but then the last test I gave it was actually in a rehearsal, so not a mic situation, a medium to low volume situation, um, I tuned the drum really high for this show, uh, not show for this, for this rehearsal because it was really the, the only tension I hadn't really worked with at that point. Uh, so I cranked it right up for a more poppy sound. Behaved really well, it didn't choke out like a lot of drums tend to do at that volume, uh, which was nice. Um, obviously very responsive with things like ghost notes because the extra tension helps, just naturally helps to have that, to have that happen. Um, but uh, no tuning bolt fell out of it, of course, on this occasion probably due to the fact that both the resonant and the batter heads were both tuned quite a bit higher. Um, so overall, across those four gigs, couldn't fault the drum in terms of its sound or its performance uh, or its ability to be tuned where you need it to be. Uh, it, it sounds well and it, and, you know, it looks great um, and, and it's very, very responsive. Again, the only negative I took from that was if you are a harder hitter, you may find that those, those tuning bolts may not hold in place, um, but it's a pretty easy fix. We'll get to that in a moment. So as far as my findings after those four shows, I think the first thing I need to point out is the, the build quality of the, of the drum. Um, now, it needs to be noted just how well this drum's actually been finished off. Um, now, when you're paying top dollar for a snare drum, you'd think that that's actually probably something that you should be, expect, that it's finished well. And most of the time, you'd be right. Um, but when I was retailing drums for you know, over a decade and I was fortunate enough to see you know, real, real high-end stuff and obviously the, the not so high-end stuff come through and you, you, you get to strip it down, work with it and you see the good and the bad and you can see the good and the bad in, in just about all of those drums right up to the very top end. Uh, and I've seen many high-end drums that, that do unfortunately have issues with their finishing, you know, both subtle and sometimes significant issues. And I think it's more common from the mass builders because they're pumping out more drums per day than, say, a private builder would do. 
Um, and when I talk about issues, what I'm talking about is things like, you know, the quality of the seams. Is it joined up really, really well? Is it nice and, and even? Has it been sanded down after it's been joined? Are there gaps in the glue where the, where the, where the seams are joining? Um, you know, how well has that been finished off? Are there rough or uneven bearing edges, for example? Do you have to sand the bearing edges because they weren't finished well enough? Um, one thing I do is I tend to take the lugs out and I have a look at the drill holes where the lugs would be screwed in and see if there's any, um, you know, any burrs or any sort of roughness in those, those holes. Um, you know, are the snare beds not sanded very well? Are they not even? All of these little things can actually be uh, a problem even for top end snare drums. Now I stripped the quokka drum down pretty much to the last screw um, and it was really, really well finished off. I actually couldn't find anything that, you know, oh, there might have been a shortcut here or he didn't think to do that. Um, everything went together really well. Nothing was over tightened, nothing was under tightened uh, and everything, including the little, the, the drill holes for the lugs were really, really nicely cut and nicely finished off. Again, Jarrah's a very dense wood so that it can be machined a little bit more accurately. Um, now, you know, just on the topic of Jarrah, um, this is somewhat expected when you get a, a drum that's made of really, really high quality. Um, if, if you've got decent wood stocks, you, you would expect to find all the things that I've been talking about prior. So, you know, a good tuning range that, that it responds really well, that it's got really loud volume, it's got a really, really solid rim shot uh, if you're playing, you know, that, that crack of the drum. So all of that, again, should be expected, but can't be guaranteed because the finish of the drum makes up for so much of that um, potential in the drum. But we're, if we're just talking about woods, you know, as I said earlier, we're lucky in Australia, we've got really, really good wood stocks for making drums. Um, and maybe I'll do a separate video on this at some point, but not all woods are suitable for making drums, as I'm sure you'd be aware. And you'll notice that many of the, particularly the major manufacturers, they for many, many decades now have been using the same woods consistently for making their drums. Uh, for example, maple, you know, is very, very common, probably, in fact, not even probably, it is the most commonly used um, maple uh, wood for making drums. There are many, many different kinds of maple, so I'm referring specifically in the top end of the scale to things like Canadian maple, North American maple, that sort of stuff. Uh, birch is also very popular for making drums. Uh, we've now seen drums coming out, you know, with oak and beech and mahogany and walnut and babinga and you know from time to time most manufacturers have sort of dabbled with that a little bit uh, but it doesn't tend to be a staple something that they've always used from the from the year dot and there's a few factors behind that so first of all why would they use those woods okay so if you're familiar with woodworking if you've done any woodworking you might be familiar with what they call the janka hardness scale that's j-a-n-k-a and it's important to know even as a drummer to have an awareness of this because Janker, the Janker scale measures woods relative to their hardness. Uh, and it was actually invented by uh, a gentleman named Janker, uh, named after him. And, and the experiment is that you, you take a piece of wood and you get a steel ball and you push down on this ball and you measure the amount of force that's needed to sink half of that ball into the piece of wood. And obviously the harder the wood, the more force is required to do it. So what they can do then is they can do this with a whole bunch of different woods and they come out with like a scale and, and the harder woods require more force to embed this ball into them. Uh, and so we get this Janker hardness scale. Um, now, North American maple, which is again, the most common wood, that comes out at about 1450 and there'll be a graphic on the screen. Um, birch, uh, not pictured, but that sort of sits around about 1260 to 1300. Um, beech is 1300. Oak is around, well, could be anywhere from sort of 1350 to around about 1700. Um, Mahogany is 1400. Uh, but when we talk about Jarrah, Jarrah is upwards of 1900 to, to about 2100. So it's harder than all of those woods. Now that's great because it means if you're going to build a shell out of this, what you should find is that the drum, once you've made it round and you've set it in, in you know, set it into shape, it should hold shape because it's, it's a very, very dense wood. Um, obviously, I measured the, the, the roundness of the quokka shell and it was fine. I normally give it a tolerance of give or take about three millimeters. Uh, the way I measure it, of course, is to go across the diameter of the drum one way, turn it 90 degrees and measure the other way. There's usually some discrepancy, um, but this one was pretty much smack on, so that's fine. Um, so the denser the wood, generally what happens is it, it's got more structural integrity. So that makes it great for making drums because we put them under a lot of pressure. Um, now, however, it's not the only part of the equation because 
the grain type, the type of grain, is it long grain, is it short grain, is it densely packed, is it not so densely packed? Those sorts of questions need to be answered before you can know whether you can use it on a drum because if you have, let's say, a wood that is, let's say it is dense, but the wood fibers themselves, the grain is running in the wrong direction or if it's uh, like quite long and stringy, then what happens is when you start cutting an edge or doing any accurate machining on that edge, you'll find that it tends to fray away. So what you want is a short fiber, a densely packed fiber and a nice hard wood. And if you get those factors, then generally it's great for making a drum. So the question then would be, well, why isn't everybody making the drums out of, you know, wood that is harder than maple? Why not make everything out of Jarrah? Why not make it out of Brazilian walnut? You saw on the graphic there that that's really dense. There's a bunch of woods. Iron wood is a whole lot harder than anything you see on that, on that uh, graphic. Uh, and this is where the real the real piece of the puzzle um, plays into it. And a lot of it has to do with restrictions on the saleability of that wood uh, and the difficulty that it, that it takes to actually work with this wood. Once things get really, really hard, uh, like physically hard to work with, often it's just not worth working with it because it's a real bugger to try and you know machine. Um, with Babinga, for example, very specific example, there were a lot of companies making Babinga. Sona was a big one in the 80s. They were making Babinga kits, but the stocks dried up. It's unfortunately not a particularly common wood uh, and to get the good stuff becomes very very expensive or they just outright don't allow you to purchase it at all so as a long-term solution for building drums it isn't great um, so there's all of these restrictions and all of these sort of things that have to work in order to give you even before you make the shell just getting hold of the right wood stocks so maple and birch tend to be the best balance in terms of these qualities so there's plenty of it around it's reasonably inexpensive but it's a nice dense wood that's nice to machine uh, and, and can be finished off really really well uh, but as i said before even when you get the good wood it needs to be finished well so if those bearing edges aren't cut, cut accurately uh, if the drum's not round etc um, then you're ruining the potential for that drum to be produced uh, to, to, to do all it can do, right? Um, now, again, I use the HD dry, so when we're talking about resonance and projection, I probably could have done well by changing that out to something thinner like a, a Remo Ambassador, um, but I just didn't have time to do it. And to be honest with you, the, the HD dry did work really well for all of my testing, so I'd have no issues in saying that you know, a thinner head would, would, would give you everything that you need as well. <coughs> Um, any case, I would be very confident in saying that the snare handles itself very, very well uh, at a low tuning, high tuning, played loud or soft uh, in the testing I did. As I said, I went from very low to very high, range of settings, messed around with the snare wires. The drum never choked out. The drum never sounded flat. It always had a good response to it. Plenty of volume, uh, in particular in the ghost notes uh, and, and just that general responsiveness of the drum uh, right the way out to the edge of the rim. It was was really really impressive. Um, I do like that they're made locally um, and just a bit of history on the name. So Tim, the, the gentleman who, who owns the, the company, um, the idea of the name Quokka sort of ties in with the whole West Australian theme and Tim, as Tim pointed out to me the Quokka is a very well-known animal around the world now largely because of the whole selfie thing that was happening about a year or two ago and, and Tim wanted to have a name for his drum that instantly made it recognisable as Western Australia, which I think is a, is a cool thing to do. And, and I couldn't think of anything myself that would identify Western Australia uh, more readily than the Quokka. So there's the history behind the name. All right, so now that I've mentioned the good things about it, um, I want to quickly talk about some of the things that I would personally improve if I was making this drum or sort of tweaking this drum from this point moving forward. Uh, and the first thing is, I talked about the tension bolts coming loose. Um, this is by no means restricted to this drum or even high-end drums, I mean that they're all susceptible to it. Uh, I've seen this happen a lot on cheaper drums. I've seen it happen on very, very expensive drums. Uh, and it can actually happen for a number of reasons, which, is, which makes it even more frustrating trying to isolate where the problem is. Uh, now, often when you get lugs from one manufacturer and you pair them up with tension bolts made from another manufacturer, there can be um, a little bit of looseness in tolerance in terms of how they're made uh, and there can be some free play between the actual tension bolt and the lug uh, and when you've got free play of course things are, are not going to sort of lock in and they can come loose that's one way um, typically I've, I've found that it's more common with triple flanged rims because the rims actually move a little bit they've got a bit more give because they're not cast um, then when you hit them they can tend to work the tension bolts loose uh, and manufacturers know this uh, and any manufacturer that's been in the game long enough 
will, uh, will and has taken steps to try to counter this issue that comes up from time to time. And one of the things they do is they've actually got nylon casings inside the lug. So um, when the tuning bolt gets tuned in, it actually has to work its way through some nylon threading as well, and that locks it into place. Um, the, the cheap way to do this, or the poor man's version of course, is to buy those lug locks that you're probably all familiar with and they sit externally on the drum and they sort of, the tension bolt passes through them before it gets into the lug and those little nylon squares just sit against the drum and they stop the, um, the bolts from detuning. Now that of course is an easy fix, the lug locks are not expensive. Uh, I wouldn't expect that a manufacturer would put those on the drum by, by default, particularly a custom builder I would expect that if I was purchasing a drum you know, of, of significant value that the, the tension bolts just don't come loose, right? That's what I'm paying for. I'm paying for quality and performance. Um, but I've also seen some people use that Loctite thread lock, uh, the blue one, which is like a temporary lock, like a glue. Uh, I personally would never let anything like that even close to my drums because it, you're adding gunk essentially to your threads, uh, which ultimately ends up in your lugs. And you know, I'm sure we can all figure out what effect that might have uh, on the drum long term. So I think the nylon inserts would be the way to go. Um, even, even the tuning bolts these days, uh, some of them even have nylon in them. So there's many ways to deal with this problem. It's not a big problem, but it's a frustrating problem. And I think um, for a drum of this quality, um, there should be steps moving forward to, to stop that from happening. Uh, now the second thing was the, the trick, the, the GS007 throw off. Said before, absolutely amazing throw off. Um, but the fact that this comes in chrome and the fact that this drum is predominantly just wood and chrome, I would have really liked to have seen the chrome throw off. Uh, my understanding is that whether you get the black or the, or the chrome, it's both the same price. Um, and, and they are expensive throw offs, but you know, again, when you're paying that sort of money, it's got to be aesthetically pleasing. And I think the chrome would really set off the lugs and just the whole design and, and, and look of this drum would be great. Um, and while on the topic of those tension bolts too, one other thing I noticed that when you're tuning these and bringing them up to tension, uh, we've got the standard steel washers there underneath the tension bolts. That's fine, but I, you know, I noticed that when you, particularly when you go to higher tunings, it tends to get a little bit grippy. Um, and I've long been an advocate of just using the, the nylon washers. Uh, you might see online that some people complain that they tune their nylon washers and they sort of pancake out and they stretch and flatten. Uh, that actually shouldn't happen. Um, if it is happening, more than likely the, the, the washers that they're using are low quality. So I'd say that if you're going to do it, you put good quality washers on there. Um, and some people, to be honest, just tune way, way too tight um, to the point where the drum is choked out. Now maybe that's the sound that they're going for, um, but you know, no drum is, is happy really being tuned at that, vo at that tension. So you've got to put in a little bit of reasonable expectation here. So my last point is, who would this sort of a drum be for? Um, because obviously, you know, when you start talking custom, uh, you have the people who need a drum like this because they want to add it to a collection. And then you have people who perhaps have the money, but they don't necessarily see why they should go a custom builder over a mass manufacturer charging the same amount for one of their snare drums. And these are interesting points and, and probably valid points to cover. Um, so who's the drum for? Well, I would say that given it's a full quality, full professional quality snare, uh, and the fact that it's custom, I'd say that it really should be for somebody who's going to want something unique. Uh, the, kind of, the kind of drummer who wants something that they can play, uh, where they'll walk into a store and they won't necessarily see this thing on a shelf for sale. It's something a little bit unique, something a little bit special for them. Uh, and, and who wouldn't want that in a snare? I mean, really, when you think about a lot of these famous drummers that have a snare sound um, that is theirs and, it, you know, and it's, it's, it's as definitive of their style as they're playing. Um, you know, if you're of that ilk and you want something a little bit special and you're prepared to reach out to a custom builder, then uh, yeah, absolutely this, this drum would be, would be for you. Um, interestingly though, uh, while it's good to get a custom drum, I don't think it's going to be for everybody. We'll get into that in a minute, but you can certainly spend more than this on a drum, but you can certainly get a really good drum for less than this as well. So in terms of value, when I'm thinking of the custom buyer, what I'm talking about is the kind of person who would go in looking for quality over price, right? They have a particular need and that need is around performance, that need is around um, perhaps aesthetics or functionality, versatility, uh, and they need to have that well before they care what the cost is. Everybody wants a good price and everybody wants value. I get that, 
but that's the kind of buyer we're looking at here. Somebody who really wants a level of quality, not a price point. Now, secondly, if you're a person who likes to work around a lot with different tunings, perhaps you're in a cover band and you're playing in a couple of different bands or you're playing in many different venues which requires you to have uh, different tunings for each gig uh, or different tunings for each band or you need to tune the snare for the room, um, this is a really good choice because as I said before, the tuning range on this is very, very wide uh, and yet it's still very responsive across all of those ranges. Um, so yeah, I, and I'm thinking of the working cover band musician here who's playing all these different places. Uh, it, this is a, a true workhorse of a snare, so and a very, very good choice for those people. And then lastly, as I touched on before, if you're in a recording studio, the fact that this has features on here, you know, like those solid lugs that we were talking about, means it's a particularly low noise snare. No rattles, no bumps. Um, so anybody who needs a good, tight, solid snare um, that's going to hold up test of time and be useful in any environment, whether it be very, very low volume like in a studio or very high volume like in a venue. On the flip side, of course, if you are the kind of person who is shopping for your gear on a particular budget or a particular price point or your main motivation is just getting the best drum that you can at the best discount or at the best price, uh, this probably isn't a drum for you. Um, now there's no retail pricing on this particular drum yet, but I did have a bit of a talk to Tim and I would expect that this drum would probably retail around about the, I'd say probably eleven to twelve hundred dollars Australian, uh, which to put that in perspective is kind of putting it in the same league as the top end drums from most other reputable manufacturers, you know, DW, Tama, Pearl, um, your Ludwigs will probably come in a little less than that, um, the Sonal stuff will be more than that, so it's pitched definitely at the pro end um, but again it is custom uh, with the exception of course of the lugs and the hardware and uh, again as a as maybe something I suggest to the manufacturers to be a true custom company it would be good to see at some point down the line um, you know Quokka drums designing or even making their own lugs because I think and even mounting systems if they get into that side of things because I think that really helps to identify and add a signature to the to the brand of the drum. It's not just about making a shell, it's about the complete package. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, everyone loves value, but if you're trying to compare this drum against something like a mass-made, uh, mid-level kind of a snare drum uh, from a major manufacturer, then I think you're probably missing the point and this drum wouldn't be for you at all. Um, now, in saying that, I don't think this drum is also suitable for somebody who's touring a lot. Uh, not that the drum won't hold up for it, uh, but if you are you know, going off and doing tour, tours interstate, particularly if you're doing tours internationally, um, I think you may struggle a little bit. Um, while most of the hardware components on here, as I said, are somewhat generic, you can source them uh, just about anywhere. So for example, if you're doing a tour, you're doing a festival in the US, or you're doing a festival in Melbourne or something like that and the, the snare thrift dies on you, well it's just a trick snare, you can go into any reputable drum store and they'll probably have one on the shelf, problem solved. Um, but you know, as with any small scale builder and any custom builder, uh, providing national and especially global support becomes a real challenge. Uh, and, and though I don't doubt that you know, Tim would probably be happy to take a phone call at four in the morning because you're in the US and something's broken, there's not a lot he's going to be able to do about it uh, and so that needs to be considered and, and on that point if you ever look at these um, these famous players who start jumping from brand to brand and everyone goes oh maybe he's not happy with the drums anymore he doesn't like the sound or uh, maybe he's getting free drums with company X or company Y that tends to not be what happens from the from the guys that I've spoken to who tour a lot and have been playing a lot it really comes down to support. It, they need that support network. If you're a sponsored player, which most of these guys are, you need to know that if you're living in France and you decide to go and do a show in America, um, often you can't bring your own drums, so you rely on your um, the company that you endorse, whether it be cymbals or drums, to have that stuff available for you or to be able to ship it to you, to have parts available, heads available, um, and because you've got so many other things to be worrying about that you just need to know that you've got that support there. So having global support is a big, big deal for name players, for people who are constantly playing in different countries and different regions of the world. And that actually is a big part of why you see these famous drummers jumping from brand to brand. It's because they need to get a certain level of global support and perhaps they're not finding that they get that, the specific support that they need for the, the shows that they're playing. 
Um, so just keep that in mind. It's not always, in fact, it's not usually the quality of the drums or the sound of the drums that, are, that is forcing these people to jump from brand to brand. Okay, so I think that just about wraps it up uh, for the drums and the history of wood and all that sort of stuff. Uh, if you enjoyed the review, feel free to let me know if there's anything else you want to review, put it in the messages below. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about this particular drum, uh, also put them in the comments. And of course, Tim is readily available from Quokka Drums and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any further questions that you might have about this product. So have a great day and until I see you on the next review, good luck.